I'm Matt. And I'm Diana. And we are Adventurous Way. We're here today with a special video to say thank you to you guys for helping us to hit a huge milestone. You have helped us hit 10,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. 10,000 people, that's a lot. In fact, that's about the size of a small stadium. And in fact, the university that I went to had about 10,000 students. So it's kind of like we're talking to everybody that I went to university with. And that is just an incredible thought. It was two years and three days since publishing the first video when we hit the 10,000 subscriber mark. And in that time, we published 104 videos. And I should probably point out at this point, Diana is the star of the show here. She is the editor, the producer. She does all of that hard work to get these videos out every single week. And before starting this YouTube channel, I did not know anything about video editing, but I have learned a lot and I actually now really enjoy it. And in case you didn't know, we actually make sure to have human edited captions on every single video that we put out. And about 10% of all our video views do have those captions turned on. So we're really striving to make them as accessible to everybody as we possibly can. And that's one thing that I'm quite proud of, that we've been able to keep it up so far. So this is a, a real special video. As we've done in the past when we've hit these milestones, we're doing a Q&A video where we've invited questions from people on our mailing list and of course our YouTube subscribers. And we're gonna do our best to answer as many of those questions here today. So the first question we have here is from This Is Liz on YouTube. And she asks, how are you progressing on your quest to visit all the national parks and monuments? Well, we are not doing so well right now. <laughs> it's going very, very slowly. Um, in fact, in 2020, we have not been to a national park unit. And um, largely this is because of uh, COVID. Yeah, we, we always knew that over sort of the, the Christmas winter period, uh, there was going to be a slowdown for us anyway in the national parks. We had, my parents had come over, we'd spent some time with them, and then we had a series of events lined up. And that kind of just rolled into COVID kicking off and the whole pandemic. While some of the national parks are still open and we could have visited some, we just didn't feel that that was what we wanted to do at the moment. Uh, not just through the safety of the situation, uh, we, we were trying to sort of stay away from, from large crowds and things, but also because we're not on a time-boxed quest to visit them. We're not trying to rush to visit them. We want to see these places at their best. Yeah. We want to see them when everything's open, when we can spend time in the visitor center, speak with the rangers and really enjoy what each national park unit has to offer. Unfortunately this year with the situation as it's been, that's just really not been possible in a lot of places. So we've been focusing on some other things while that's been going on, but don't worry, we will be getting back to the national parks. These are still places that we really want to explore and visit and have some great adventures in. And so once things start to improve, of course, we're going to be visiting plenty more national parks. And on the plus side, uh, we accomplished a lot of other things. So we did our R reader model and also we caught up on a lot of work and on video editing. So now our videos are pretty much real time, maybe like one or two week delay versus before I had the backlog of nine months to edit and that was just a lot. So now we've been able to get through a lot of that. And that's why if you saw some of our videos all the way through to kind of the summer period that was still about national parks, that was the places that we'd been at the back end of last year. Yeah. But this winter, we're going to be hunkered down and we're going to try and share some more videos about our adventures around here and maybe some more RV life things. But don't worry, when the opportunity arises to visit a national park unit and we can really enjoy it and explore, we will be doing so. So the next question comes from Polar Bear and Sun. How are you managing the COVID situation? Um, so as we said, uh, we are not visiting the national parks as one example. Um, overall, our plans have changed a little bit. Our, our plan for this year was to go to Europe and spend time with family and travel around Europe. That obviously did not happen and not, is not going to happen anytime soon. But overall, we're just traveling slower. We're staying at uh, each place for longer and uh, we're not moving as fast paced that it was before. And I think it's fine. We don't really mind the change. Yeah. And honestly, RV life for us has actually kind of worked really well, I guess, bizarrely during this time. We had already been used to spending extended periods of time on our own, in the middle of nowhere, far from civilization. Um, so we've largely been able to continue 
at least using those things that we'd learned uh, during this time. And so, yes, it's been a terrible time uh, and it's definitely changed our plans. And I know for many people out there, it's been incredibly disruptive. Um, we are very fortunate that we've been able to continue fairly normally throughout sure. this. Um, but obviously it's, like you say, it's, it's hugely disrupted things for us as well. Fingers crossed, uh, things can get back to at least some semblance of normal and we can start traveling. But for the time being, our priority really is just on staying safe, making the most of the situation and doing as best as we can, given, given what's going on. Yeah, and we are um, staying productive, as we said, with, you know, remodel as we did, um, with keeping up with the work and then also, you know, thinking about our future plans. So in next video, we will share uh, why we are uh, staying in Vermont for the winter and what are our future plans. Yes, you heard that right. This winter, we're going to be staying in northern Vermont, where temperatures are going to get a little bit cold. And already here, we're filming this at the start of November in New Hampshire still. Yeah. And already we've had a few days of snow and temperatures well below freezing. It's going to be cold this winter, but there's a reason that we are doing it. So stay tuned for the next video. The next question here is from Laura and she asks, do you keep your refrigerator running on propane while traveling? That is a simple question. We keep the refrigerator on, but we do not run it off propane. Our propane is off during travel. That's right. As part of the walk around that we always do before any travel day, one of the things we check is that the propane is turned off. We are able to keep the fridge running, but we run it on the AC electric mode by keeping our inverter running. Uh, so it pulls about 300 watts, but thanks to the DC to DC charger that we have that pulls power from the truck, we pull about five to 600 watts in from the truck. Long story short, we can happily run the fridge on the AC electric mode while charging the batteries while traveling. So that's what we do. It works great. I know some people just turn the fridge off and as long as you keep the door closed, then it stays pretty yeah. cold. That's true. Uh, often, however, on travel days for us, we combine those with kind of errands and things, one of which is grocery shopping. So oftentimes we'll stop in at a grocery store or even somewhere like Costco, where we might be adding more food to the fridge, which if the fridge was turned off, wouldn't then get cold. So we really like the fact that we can have the fridge running on AC while we're driving. Okay, next question. Our next question comes from Charles and he says, we would love to hear about your outdoors RV the selling dealer, the services, and whether we're satisfied with the rig. Well, I can start with the, the dealer experience that we had. We bought our RV from Cordelia RV uh, in California, not too far from San Francisco. Honestly, the experience was super quick and painless. We had already done so much research yeah. in advance. We'd spent two years researching which RV to buy, including renting several RVs and doing a factory tour of the Outdoors RV factory, that when it came to buying the RV, we already knew exactly which RV we wanted and we were able to walk straight into the dealership, find it on the, on the lot, and that's the RV that we bought and the RV that we're, we're still in now. Yeah. Since then, we've been to uh, Thompson RV. We've not been back to Cordelia simply because we left the Bay Area soon after buying the RV and actually haven't been back since then. We knew we will be full-timing, so the, the chances that we would be back at the same dealer for services were very slim. So we didn't really... Yeah. That wasn't really a selling point for us. But we have been to Thompson RV. They are an outdoors RV dealership up in Pendleton, Oregon, only about 45 minutes or so from the outdoors RV factory in La Grande. We spent some time with them uh, looking through their inventory and just doing some walkthroughs of some of the rigs. Those guys really, really know their stuff. And if you are interested in outdoors RV, you could do a lot worse than giving them a call. Or better yet, check out some of our videos uh, that we'll link in the description below where we visited them and we did some walk arounds with Corinne Thompson from that dealership. And in terms of how satisfied we are with the rig, we still are two years later. In fact, two and a half years later, we're still very satisfied. Obviously we are living it in full time. So there is wear and tear over time and like some things kind of break through our own fault or it's just use over time. But I mean, pretty much most things we've been able to fix either with the screwdriver or with glue. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and honestly, like if something happened to this RV now, we would go out and not only buy another outdoors RV again, I think we'd buy exactly the same model, the 21 RBS all over again. It's just worked really, really well for us. That said, I hope nothing happens to this rig because we have spent a lot of time upgrading it, doing the mods, yeah. and of course the remodel. In fact, you can see behind the, the kitchen remodel that we did here, uh, we really, really like this rig. I think the true test of its kind of four season credentials yes. will be this winter though. 
So we'll just have to see whether it holds up to, uh, to the, the cold that Vermont has to offer. Yes. Okay, uh, moving on. Uh, the next question here is from Gerald, and he's asked us to discuss the roof maintenance in the context of the solar panels. Uh, any choke points or inadequacies of our current setup? I mean, roof maintenance, you haven't really done anything. Uh, no, I mean, I, I periodically check it, uh, maybe once every couple of months, probably not as often as I should, just to make sure that there's no signs of leaks or damages and things. Thanks to the monitoring system that we have, we keep a pretty close eye on the uh, the solar production that's coming in. So I think if something catastrophic had happened, we yeah. would we would know pretty quickly because we, we do rely on that solar power uh, or have been doing most of the year. As for any choke points or inadequacies, uh, when we hit the road, just as, as way of background, we had no solar at all on the roof and all we had was a 100 watt portable solar panel. We knew that wasn't going to be enough. That was just to get us going. Uh, it wasn't long, maybe what, three or four months before we put some panels on the roof yeah. and we started with 400 watts on the roof. A few months later, we upgraded that to 600 watts. So that's what we are still rolling with now on the roof. Plus we have the 200 watt DIY portable panel that I made um, a little while later. Obviously you can always have more power. Um, there, there, you can never have enough solar on the roof, I don't think. Uh, that said, the setup that we have has actually done everything we've asked of it. We spent several months this summer uh, totally off grid in yeah. Washington and it performed flawlessly. I mean, it was allowing us to do the instant pot yeah. and electric water heater and things. Even before that, in the spring, we had 100 days of dry camping the whole time in the, in the desert. In fact, most of the 2020, before we got uh, to East Coast, we had spent dry camping on all because of the solar. Yeah, and it works really well. Uh, we don't have a generator. So for us, we don't really have a good backup. Uh, if we do run out of power, the best we can do is plug the truck in and using that DC to DC charger. Like I say, that'll put about five or 600 watts in, but that means idling the truck, which is definitely not something we want to be doing. In an emergency, obviously it would it would help us out, but, but no, honestly, it works really, really well. But that said, over on the East Coast in the areas we are now, more solar would not help because there's just so much more tree cover. Yeah. So we are staying at RV parks. Also, there's slightly less uh, dry camping opportunities to, where you can dry camp for a longer time. I mean, obviously you can use harvest host and dry camp for a couple days, um, or actually one day at a time. Um, yeah, so we are at our parks, but we do like our um, system, even when we're staying in our parks. The next question here comes from Roger, and he's asked us about the work that we've done to the RV in terms of the, re the remodel and the upgrades, as to how we feel about what that's done to the resale value, whether there's going to be maybe a little increase in value, and also, have we thought about what our next RV might be? Uh, let's start with the second part. As we said before, we really, really like this RV. And this RV really, really suits us really well for the type of RV you want to do. So we see ourselves keeping it for many, many years. Um, so we haven't really thought much about uh, resale value or depreciation because we're just not planning on getting a new RV anytime soon. And, and a big part of that is because this is our home. And when you live in what, 180 square feet or so, it's really important that every single square foot is optimized to make the most of it. And so we really have spent some time and money investing in this space and making it our own. But we felt comfortable doing that because we don't have these plans to, to sell and buy a yeah. new one. Yeah. And I think one of the reasons that we've been able to have that confidence is because we did so much research ahead of time to find a brand that we felt delivered the quality and a floor plan and a model that gave us the functionality that we needed in the RV. And the RV is 25 feet tip to tip and we really, really like that size. And in the beginning when we were looking at fifth wheels versus travel trailers, uh, we were not able to find really small fifth wheels. So we went with a travel trailer because we would, could get a smaller trailer. So to answer your question, uh, I don't know what some of our mods have done to the resale value. I would like to think we've added some value. We've definitely added more functionality with the, the batteries, the inverter, the solar, the remodel. A lot of the other mods we've done, I think have made it a, a better trailer. Um, but at the end of the day, an RV is a depreciating asset. So who knows? But it doesn't really matter because we're not planning to sell it anytime yes. soon anyway. Okay, uh, moving on to the next question. Uh, have a question here from Bob Kay, who has a question. With living in such a small space, how are you able to give or get some me time during the day? 
in the beginning, it was definitely a struggle. Before, when we lived together, we lived in a big house, but we also worked um, and we were um, kind of away from each other for most of the day. And even spent with the long commute, we only really spent only a couple hours each day together. Um, so it was an adjustment, but now, I mean, now it's really good. Um, I think some of the tips are, would be maybe, um, I go for runs, maybe not every day, I mean, in the summer, quite often, we'll see what happens in the winter. Uh, but that's um, a little bit of uh, kind of me time by myself. And then also, uh, when we work, we put headphones on. And then if I'm really working and focused on editing and have my headphones on, then kind of we are next to each other, but I feel like in my own thoughts and by myself. Um, so it doesn't feel... Yeah anymore that we are enriching in each other's space. Yeah, headphone, a good pair of headphones is, is definitely uh, a must here. Uh, one of the things that people told us early on when we looked at RVing was to live in an RV together, it's not enough just to love each other, you have to like each other. Yes. Uh, and it turns out we do, uh, yes. so this is, this is a good sign. Um, but no, we are spending 24 hours a day with each other and it is sometimes hard to get that me time uh, and get some alone time. But I think, like you say, we've kind of made it work. And sometimes I'll go off and run errands in town on my own yeah. and, and things like that. So that gives us a bit of space as well. But it's certainly a big change from what we were used to beforehand when, like you say, we were commuting or at work for a vast majority of the, of the day. So I think basically the key is you can still be together in the small space, but uh, if your mental spaces are separate at least for us, or at least for me, that still feels as me time. If I'm reading a book or working or, or even doing dishes and I'm listening to podcasts, that still feels like my own separate time. I guess basically we just ignore each other. <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we're still, like you say, close to each other, but we're headphones on or, or whatever, and we, we make it work. Yeah. Okay, next up. Um, someone who has unfortunately just had to put their RV into storage for the winter. This is from Esther. She says, can you discuss camping withdrawal? Uh, she's missing her trailer already and can't wait for next spring. Full camping has been so nice, but tonight it's already two Celsius. I guess all I can say is try some winter camping. Yeah. It's what we're about to do. Um, no, I mean, honestly, camping withdrawal, it's not something that we've dealt with yet. Since we, we moved into the RV, we haven't really stopped living in the RV. I think we have felt some withdrawal from the travel side of things. Our camping yeah. style this year has obviously changed with the, the COVID situation. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, I'll go back to figure out how to camp in winter. Like uh, before RVing, we went camping um, and I actually have done winter camping like in the tent. Um, so adding, I guess, more range of activities that you could do uh, in winter. I like hiking in winter, that's also doable. Um, for us, uh, skiing, it's always been a hobby that we've done in winter. Um, so yeah, I guess depending on the area where you live and how easy it or hard it is to go out uh, with RV or whether it's even safe with the roads and so on, um, maybe find some other winter activities that you like to do. So a couple of other tips. If you aren't able to use your RV in winter, see if there's some opportunities to do some mods and some upgrades on it. Mm -hmm. It's a great time to look at what would have made life last summer more comfortable if we added that to the RV, whether that's solar, whether that's some simple mods in and around the RV for organization, any of those little things, that downtime in winter could be a great time to look at those. Second tip I would give you is something that we learned before we even had the RV which is at the end of each road trip we used to spend the long drive home and it was obviously a long drive a lot of the time we might be traveling across several states we would use that that long journey home to plan the next trip yeah so really use this time during winter to to plan out your camping vacations and your camping trips for next summer next spring and next summer and maybe try some things you haven't tried before some new destinations new styles of camping if you haven't boondocked before you haven't dry camped before have a think about what some of the places that you'd like to go would be if you're able to start dry camping and again, back to that first idea, are there any mods and things that you could do over winter that would make those possible? So yeah, I'm sorry that you've had to uh, winterize your RV, um, but uh, spring will be here soon enough and I'm sure you'll be able to get back out and enjoy it.
We get a lot of questions on YouTube about uh, various things that we've actually covered on the blog. For instance, people ask us about our internet setup on the road, some of the details about our solar setup, the camera gear that we use, and even some of the smart home automation stuff that we have in here to control yeah. our lights and our appliances. If those things are interesting to you, I highly recommend you check out our blog at adventurousway.com. There's a link in the description below for that. We've got loads and loads of good blog posts on there about all the things that we've done in the RV, our mods, our upgrades, some things about our RV lifestyle. So do be sure to check those out. If you have questions though, of course, leave us a comment uh, or drop us an email and we'll do our best to answer as many of those as we can as time goes by. We are also looking forward to spending winter in the RV. While it might be cold, uh, hopefully it should be pretty good fun as well. We've got lots of skiing planned. We've done a blog post there about how we've mm -hmm. prepared our RV for winter so far. We would also love to hear from you if you've got any tips on, on winter camping, things that we haven't thought of yet. Please leave us a comment on that blog post and let us know what we should be thinking about uh, but aren't maybe yet. But yeah, we have got a lot of information on there. And of course, if you haven't already done so, sign up for our email newsletter. We send out a newsletter every Thursday yep. where we just give a real-time update on what we've been up to, some of the things that we're doing, and of course, an update on the latest news and articles on our website. So really, thank you all 10,000 of you who have subscribed and thanks for joining us for this video. And if you aren't one of the 10,000 people that's already subscribed, then be sure to do that because you do not want to miss our next video when we've got a pretty special announcement about our plans for the future. We'll see you next time. The next question here is from Laura and she asks, do you keep your refrigerator running on propane while traveling? This is a simple question. Uh, no, we keep it off. That's not true. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's oh, not no. what we do. <laughs> Sorry, no, it's like, Oh, propane is off. Well, propane right. is off. Yes, okay. The, the fridge. The fridge is off. It's exactly off. Okay, try to start again. Simple question. Yes. <laughs>